Good afternoon and uh, Happy New Year. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, David Yermak, who is uh, the chairman of the finance department at New York University, and is going to give today the first of three lectures on uh, sort of uh, fintech in general. And uh, one of the reasons why, as a Stigler Center, we decided to bring David here and discuss this is because, as David will make it clear, there is a very uh, strong connection between regulation and uh, uh, financial innovation. And in particular, uh, as David will tell us, uh, the uh, existing firms are using innovation, uh, sorry, are using uh, regulation to, uh, as a barrier to entry uh, against new entrants because they're afraid there will be no room for them in the future. So this is very much like in the spirit of, uh, of Stiegler. For those of you who don't know, George Stiegler was the first one in 1971 to say that uh, regulation is used by uh, incumbent to block entry. And so this is very much a Stieglerian uh, uh, topic. And uh, the three lectures will be somehow uh, detached, so you can attend one and not the others. However, if you, if you have to miss it for other commitments, uh, they're going to be taped and they will be available on the site uh, of the Stigler Center soon. And uh, so you can uh, get to enjoy them uh, in, uh, uh, in any way. Um, we are going up to one, and David, welcome uh, your questions. If you cannot be heard, there are some microphones there so that uh, you, you can be heard. And um, David, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming out. And since we're at the University of Chicago, I thought I'd start with a brief video clip of Milton Friedman. And this is from 1999, where he you know, more or less predicts the arrival of Bitcoin and sovereign digital currency. Let me just play it. So that I think that the Internet is going to be one of the major forces for reducing the role of government. And the one thing that's missing, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash, a method whereby on the Internet you can transfer funds from A to B, without A knowing B or B knowing A, the way in which I can take a $20 bill and hand it over to you, then there's no record of where it came from. And you, you may get that without knowing who I am. That kind of thing will develop on the Internet, and that will make it even easier for people to use the Internet. Of course, it has its negative side. It means that uh, the gangsters, the people who are engaged in illegal transactions, will also have an easier way to carry on their business. Now, it's surprising looking back how forward-looking Friedman th this quote was. And what... It's a process that even today, uh -oh. few bankers understand. <laughs> Let's just... There we go. Um, I think as everybody knows in the year 2008, a very mysterious person, still unknown, proposes this payment system called Bitcoin, which has gone live. And this is the kind of news story that got me interested in this about four years ago. This is a couple on their honeymoon who are going from Stockholm to Seattle to Berlin and so forth. And for more than 100 days, they live only on Bitcoin. In other words, they drop off the grid and live in this parallel world where there's a new payment system with no government connected to it, and are able to support themselves because there are enough hotels and food shops and travel providers and so forth that they can um, pretty much opt out of the society we know and pursue their own life with a totally unregulated environment. Now, there's a big problem. If you look closely, they're wearing the same clothes in every photograph, right? <laughs> Which tells you there's no Bitcoin laundromats and so forth. But nevertheless, this has come further faster than I think anybody would have imagined. And where we are with this right now, I actually need the internet back for just a moment here. Um, well, maybe not. I, I was done in by that Friedman thing. Um, you have this security that is trading um, recently at a price of about $900 for one Bitcoin. And if you had invested in this about two years ago, it's enjoyed a very nice run-up.
But I don't really want to dwell on Bitcoin. And I think, as most people know, there are limits to Bitcoin. It's never going to become the world's super universal currency because of certain bottlenecks that are very hard to get around. What's much more important is the technology behind it. The so-called blockchain and distributed ledger that were innovations that have been around for some time, but that are brought together in a particularly clever way by the designers of Bitcoin and are now really threatening to remake the world's financial system from the top down in a way that threatens the existence of all the banks and stock exchanges and all of the legacy financial institutions that you're probably very familiar with and are probably thinking that you might get a job with at some point. Um, I expect that within the next 10 years, probably half of the banks will be gone. Um, they'll probably merge with each other in a series of defensive mergers, and many of them are actively using current regulation, as Luigi said, to try to co-opt this technology into their business models, at least in a limited way, to forestall what looks like a very serious day of reckoning that may not be too far into the future. I'm not sure that stock exchanges will continue to exist or things like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And if they do, they're probably going to be greatly reduced in size, much simpler and more streamlined, and ultimately more beneficial to the customer. Now, to put this into context, I think you have to consider this to be part of the peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy that has been growing in different forms around the world over the last 20 or 30 years. And one industry that I think is a particularly good point of reference would be the music industry. Um, you guys look like you're a certain age, but do you remember record stores? You know, Tower Records, Sam Goody, and so forth. Those are gone now, except for nostalgia and so forth. But this used to be how people distributed music, and it was a huge industry employing thousands of people around the world. Um, Napster changed all that. Napster is a file sharing service that was developed by a kid in Massachusetts about 20 years ago, and it made it possible for people to copy and share music in a way that maybe was or was not legal, but spread like a virus and completely changed the distribution of, of music. There's more music being produced today than ever, and the technology has been co-opted by people like Apple. You can now get your music on iTunes. But you get it in a very different way. For 99 cents a track, it's not bundled in albums. And the amount of money being made by everybody from the recording artists on down is completely different. Um, eBay is another peer-to-peer -peer system that matches up people with things in their attic with people who happen to need them. And I think unlike Napster, eBay is different because it creates a market that didn't exist before. You know, it greatly expands the market for used goods. And it's hard to identify anybody who's a loser. Um, the two big companies operating in this space, who many of you probably have firsthand knowledge of, would be Uber and Airbnb. Um, Uber is decimating the taxi industry, even here in Chicago. I've used it three times already since I got here, haven't used the taxis at all. But Uber is also creating a bigger market. There are actually more people taking rides and more people employed, but in a very different way. Airbnb is the biggest hotel company in the world by room nights. And the regulators are allowing things like the merger of Marriott and Sheraton, the legacy hotel chains, because they realize that the entire industry is now being remade and disrupted from the top down by a completely different business model. Now, each of these companies has a market value somewhere north of $50 billion, if you look at what investors are paying to buy new equity in them. And by now, each of these companies ordinarily would have gone public on the stock market you know, under normal conditions, but they are both studiously avoiding this. I think what is likely to happen is that they will go public and many other of these unicorn technology companies will probably also go public, but in a very different way. They will probably go public in some kind of a blockchain stock market. And in fact, this is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is how corporate finance is likely to look on these new platforms. But what's the last big IPO that you can actually remember? Um, nobody's interested in the old stock market and in underwriting the way that we know it with the spreads and the asymmetric information and so forth. And I think you know, the way that these people are raising capital and thinking about the financial structure of the firm is really quite different than anything that we've seen before. Now, what about in the financial services industry itself? 
Um, I think PayPal is a very interesting early mover in this field. It allows essentially two individual people to transfer value. And there is a credit card company intermediating these transactions. But PayPal has branched out into other services like Venmo and other mobile payment apps that are very widely used by young people and have questioned the need for the middleman and the types of services that traditionally banks and credit card companies have provided. In the developing world, you see things like M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a service in Kenya that allows you to use mobile phone minutes as a way of transferring value. It's essentially a remittance service. And in a country like Kenya, there are many, many people who don't have bank accounts, but almost all of them have mobile phones. And so if you are working in the city and you have a mother in the village a thousand miles away, you can charge up your phone with minutes, zap them to her phone. She can then liquidate them locally or even spend them as currency. This became, in other words, a serious rival to the government's currency. And this is a company owned by Vodafone. Vodafone found itself registering for a banking license. It didn't realize it was in the banking business until this thing succeeded wildly. I've met people from Kenya and asked them, doesn't this make Vodafone into your central bank? And they say, yes, we trust Vodafone more than we trust the central bank. That's, that's sort of the whole point behind all this. And the, the threat to a sovereign government when a commercial provider can come in and provide financial services better than the government can, the threat to the um, government's ability to control the population and the economy is, is all too obvious. Now, the big breakthrough comes with Bitcoin. And I don't want to dwell on Bitcoin in this lecture, but I am going to go carefully through the design of the blockchain and the architecture behind it and so forth. But the key is this. It's who comes in the middle. Um, the PayPal network ultimately depends on MasterCard and Visa to process the payments, and they take a cut. And M-Pesa depends on the phone company to act as the middleman. Bitcoin is completely different because there is no third-party central authority. There's a cryptographic process where essentially the consensus of the people on the network validate payments and transactions. And the removal of any third party is really what the innovation here is. And at first, it was only obvious to tech people and computer scientists who were looking at this. But when you really stand back and understand what's going on here, it gets you right away into asking questions about, do we really need to have banks in the future? We've had banks for thousands of years. Banks are some of the oldest institutions in society, but they seem to have come up with a way that questions, you know, is there any value to them? Do they, do they perform any service that we couldn't just perform collectively among ourselves? I think a good point of introduction to this area is a cover story that ran in The Economist magazine. This was a little over a year ago in October 2015, and they called the blockchain a trust machine. In other words, it's a technology that creates trust out of thin air if people collaborate using a certain set of codes and proofs that they agree to, to share with each other. Um, if you read the last sentence here, it says, the blockchain lets people who have no particular confidence in each other collaborate without having to go through a neutral central authority. Simply put, it is a machine for creating trust. So, I would recommend that you download, spend the 20 minutes to read this if you want to get a point of entry to the literature because it's a well-written, very thorough description of both the structure of this and the range of potential applications that, that it has. Now, I want to focus mostly on the financial industry. And here's one article from the Wall Street Journal talking about one bank, which happens to be UBS, one of the two big Swiss banks. And to pull out a couple quotes, they say that the blockchain has been increasingly eyed by mainstream financial institutions as a breakthrough. It could enable them to settle trades in seconds rather than in two or three days. And the technology could reduce the infrastructure cost of the bank by as much as $20 billion a year by 2022. So this is one bank that thinks it could save $20 billion a year. Now, multiply this across all the banks. And there's probably 30 or 40 banks in the world of the same size as UBS. 
And think about the amount of value that's really at stake here. And it begins to become some significant fraction of the whole revenue of the finance industry. And what you're really talking about here, of course, are people's jobs. The um, gold rush has begun. This is one of my favorite slides. It's a timeline that starts in 2014. And what they're marking is the first publicly announced investments by legacy banking firms in the blockchain technology. And at first, these are kind of people you haven't heard so much about, although New York Stock Exchange and Goldman Sachs are, are early adopters. But in the fall of 2015, a little over a year ago, there's just a mass of banks basically acting out of the same impulse, which is fear. That, as I hope is clear within 20 or 30 minutes, this really calls into question why you need banks at all. And what's going on right now is a search for how they can use this technology to create barriers to entry that will allow them to prolong their franchise maybe for another five or 10 years. But I think in the long run, this is a losing proposition that the models that the banks are using are really quite restrictive. They're not taking full advantage of the technology. And ultimately, they're probably going to lose out in the marketplace as a younger generation is much more comfortable with handheld commerce, peer-to-peer, -peer, much cheaper transactions that are simply going to cause the banks, I think, to wither away. So this is um, one analysis by Morgan Stanley which is doing a timeline of how does this technology spread and get adopted. So you go through things like the proof of concept and then shared infrastructure among the major providers and then basically user applications. And so we're somewhere here at a point of great acceleration and inflection where the proof of concept work is well underway and a lot of this has really been completed to a lot of people's satisfaction. The news story I wanted to show you, which my browser closed me out of, there's an, an announcement just this morning in New York by the Deposit Trust Clearing Corporation that they're going to move a lot of their derivatives market to a blockchain platform with IBM as the main vendor. And when organizations like the DTCC, which does like a lot of the derivatives you know, for the whole United States, these are the big boys. And what they're clearly worried about is whether the need for them to exist at all in the future is, is going to continue. But you've got all the big players in the market now taking note of this technology. And you know, do we need all these things in the future is very much on the minds of everybody. I think in the long run, the biggest applications are actually in the public sector. I think anything kept track of on a database is amenable to the use of a blockchain. And nobody has bigger databases than the government, which has things like demographic records, social security, driver's licenses, also property registration for real estate, motor vehicles, and so forth. Um, a number of governments around the world are looking at this very, very aggressively. And I would cite the United Kingdom and Australia as probably the two most active. But the cost savings in the public sector have such a huge opportunity in terms of reducing the taxes of the population and so forth that I think in the long run, where you're really going to see this most in your daily lives and see the biggest economic impact is in improving the efficiency of the public sector. That will come later. And whether you need people like auditors who are in the trust business, who verify the behavior of other people, whether you need lawyers to settle disputes in a world where there are smart contracts that execute themselves, all of these questions are now up for grabs and are creating a lot of concern, but at the same time, a lot of opportunity. So here's my last intro slide before we get into some of the details. Um, this is an announcement by a European bank, Commerce Bank in Germany, and it says that they are going to cut 10,000 jobs, which is roughly 20% of the workforce. Now, most of you guys, I guess, are MBA students. And these are not the kind of stories you like to see. Um, my school is heavily focused on finance, for better or for worse. And in fact, many of the, the employers are banks in New York. These kinds of stories are coming out a lot. It's not just Commerce Bank, but also Citibank and Goldman Sachs and people like that who already have or actively are shrinking their headcount. And if you read further, it says simultaneously they plan to hire 2,300 new staff focused on digitizing internal processes. 
The only people the banks want to hire anymore are quant people. And I don't mean financial quants. I mean people who can code, who know big data, data analytics, programming in Python, and things like that. The old jobs of analysts and you know, loan officers, sales and trading, those jobs are gone. And this is a big problem for us in New York as a business school because these are the jobs that we know how to train people for. And what we've seen is that the career office is not seeing these people come to hire anymore. And students are no longer enrolling in these courses. Um, Luigi mentioned I'm the department chair, so I assign people to teach. And I've got a lot of faculty who want to teach stuff where nobody's enrolling. And getting them to learn this blockchain stuff and, you know, is a very, very difficult resource allocation problem. We'll solve it in the long run. In fact, we're introducing a lot of fintech courses in our program. But this is the job market that you guys are looking at. Um, business education is probably more threatened than any other industry I can think of by the arrival of this technology. And we need to adapt very quickly our curriculum and build links with new recruiters. Um, this kind of story you see all the time every week in the papers. So you have very different jobs being hired for, and there's a lot fewer of them than before. And I don't want to ruin anybody's lunch, but I think being in denial or ignorance about this is the very worst thing that you can do. OK, so let me now talk about the details of the blockchain. I, I hope that by the top of the hour, you guys understand how this works, what some of the potential uses of it are. And I would welcome interruptions. You know, feel free to stop me or disagree. Um, and I'll leave at least some time at the end for questions as well and continue this, of course, into tomorrow. So the blockchain is actually not a new idea. Um, there's really two big ideas. One is the blockchain, and the other is something called a distributed ledger or a shared ledger. And both of them come out of an academic paper that was written back in 1991. So this is the original paper. And the authors were data scientists who were working at Bell Labs. It was renamed Bellcor by that time. But this is a well-known research organization where many breakthroughs in data science have occurred throughout the 20th century. And the problem they were concerned with was, as they wrote in the title, how to timestamp a digital document. In other words, they are interested in authenticating intellectual property. So in a world where a lot of the valuable property is maybe a track of music or a computer file or you know, whatever, it's, it's virtual property, proving ownership is much more difficult than putting a fence around it or stamping it with a seal. And they proposed the structure of a blockchain where you would arrange the records in a certain sequence. I'll talk more about it in a moment. And you would validate the records by showing that they have a certain point in the chain. And then you would share the ledger with everybody so that the public could look at it. And if you tampered with any one of the records, it would throw the whole thing off. And you could call somebody a fraud if they were a fraud. And this idea was actually a very successful one in that it led to a lot more academic research and some entrepreneurial applications. But it was taken to the next level it took 17 years, but in 2008, it's brought into the world of financial services by a mysterious character called Satoshi Nakamoto, who to this day remains unidentified. We don't know who this person was or maybe a group of people. Um, there have been a number of suspects. This is an intriguing mystery that is one of the curiosities of this whole thing. But what Nakamoto did was take the work of Haber and Stornetta, these two authors, introduce an incentive scheme and a number of other clever cryptographic devices and create what he called a peer-to-peer -peer payment system, more or less along the lines of what Milton Friedman was talking about in that video clip. So he publishes a white paper on an internet bulletin board. And he, it really reads like a manifesto. It's just a lot of declarative sentences that condemn the current financial system. And he says that commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. And by this, he means MasterCard and Visa. And he then goes on to say that these people are very expensive. And because the cost of dispute resolution is so high, what he calls micropayments, small transactions, are all but impossible. 
So you can't spend $2 on electronic commerce and so forth. And he says there's got to be a better way. What's needed is an electronic payment system that is based not on trust, but instead on cryptographic proof. And he creates this thing called Bitcoin, which some eager volunteers program up, and it goes live on January 3rd, 2009. So it's been operating now for a little over eight years without any successful hacking or takedown. Um, it's, in fact, incredibly surprising how resistant this has been in a world where financial compromises occur all the time. I mean, I had two credit cards hacked just last week, and I think many of you have had similar experience. I was worried about traveling here because suddenly all the credit cards are gone out of my wallet and so forth. Anyhow, what's on the blockchain? It's data that in many ways is completely ordinary and unsurprising. So this is one scheme where you would actually want to read this from the bottom up according to these timestamps. But you have a person who has a certain number of bitcoins at their address and they want to send them to the next person. And so this is the number that they're going to send. And they have digital addresses. And so this is where it came from and where it's going. And then the next transaction will be where it came from, the next person who gets it, and so forth. And then you have to provide what is called a private key. This is essentially a password that authenticates the transaction. So source, destination, timestamp, amount, this is very ordinary information that you might find in the ledger of a bank. So by itself, this is not particularly remarkable. But the way it's put together and organized in a database is really completely unique. So in the world of Haber and Stornetta, every transaction was its own block. You would just sequence stuff together and they weren't particularly worried about storage requirements. But if you're going to have a payment system, there's going to be thousands, even millions of transactions, and you have to worry about computer memory. So Nakamoto proposed to bundle these things together into blocks, and a block can hold about 2,000 transactions. So in the current Bitcoin network, a new block is created every 10 minutes. That's a design choice, and you could start your own currency and have a faster cycle time or a different block size. And in fact, people have done this. There's now more than 700 of these digital currencies. But the way these blocks work is that they hold a bundle of transactions. Here they've drawn just four transactions, A, B, C, and D, but imagine there's 2,000. And what you do is you consolidate these using what are called hash functions. So H of A is the hash function of transaction A, H of B is B's hash function, and so forth. Now, I'll come back to this, but we need to understand what is a hash function. These were developed by the National Security Agency in Washington and are kind of the workhorses of modern cryptography. What a hash function does is take an input of any length and generates a fixed length output in a way that is somewhat similar to a barcode. So as an example, I took three phrases here that are rather close to each other. And using this particular hash code algorithm, you can do this on a website. If you type in NYU Stern School of Business, this is the hash, which is, I think, 64 characters long. You see that you get the digits 0 through 9 and the letters A through F. If I put periods but otherwise leave it the same, you see that I get another hash function that is almost completely different from the first. There's almost no way to connect the first to the second and to tell that it's just a small tweak. And if I shorten this to just NYU, which is a six character input, I get something that looks like this. So the properties of a hash function is that they are always a fixed length, which means that you can't really tell what the length of the input was. A small change in the input leads to a vast change in the output, so that if you've tampered with even one digit in a transaction, it's obvious that the whole thing is different. And you can't go backwards, and this is one thing that's quite different from a barcode. I can scan a barcode, like the one on my airline boarding pass, and it will say, this is Dave in seat 27A. It you know, recovers the information that went into creating the code. You cannot do this with a hash function. And it's a one-way type of cryptography, which means that if you wish to hack this, the only way to hack it is by trial and error. 
that requires essentially so much computational brute force as to be all but impossible. So what Nakamoto does on the blockchain is hashes all the transactions one by one. And then one thing you can put into a hash function is another hash function as input. So this thing called H of A, B is actually just hashing A and B together into a single hash function. And what you do in the Bitcoin blockchain is just concatenate these things. You put two together, and then you put those together and so forth, to the point that you get something called the root. It's called the Merkle root, named after Ralph Merkle, who's a father of modern cryptography. And you can take 2,000 hash functions and condense them into one. If you change even one decimal point or digit of any of the input functions, it throws off the whole tree. And that's sort of the value of, the, of distributing the ledger to everybody, is that anybody, what fraud means is that you go change a number. Anybody who does this will throw off the entire ledger, and you won't need an auditor to go through with a fine-tooth comb looking to see if anything's gone wrong. The fact that something's been changed will be obvious to everybody. Now, the last thing that goes into each block is, in addition to the transactions, you take a hash of the header of the previous block. And this is the chaining of the blocks. This is one of the really clever ideas of Haber and Stornetta, is I'm going to take all these transactions and then combine them with the hash of the previous block and then include that in the next block. So that each block depends on the block before it. And if I change just one of these transactions, not only does it throw off this whole block, but it throws off every other block into the future. So somebody who wished to tamper with this ledger would have to recreate every single block with all these hash codes. And the computational difficulty of this is prohibitively difficult. You know, there's no computer in the world fast enough to do this before the honest people code in the next set of new transactions. So this is a really clever way of assuring the security of data. Really, for thousands of years, we've relied on trusted third parties, bank inspectors, accounting firms, and so forth, who come in and do spot checks of records. But here we have a system that if anybody changes even one number or backdates even one timestamp, it throws the entire ledger off, and it throws it off at exactly the point where they tampered at it. So not only can we tell that somebody's cheating, we can tell exactly where and when they're cheating. And it's really a clever way to deter fraud. And it lets you ask the question, why do we need auditors anymore? Now, you guys, anyone studying accounting? Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. And this is, <laughs> I, I, I gave a keynote speech to this accounting association of all the giving lifetime awards, professors, and so forth. And I said, in 10 years, all you guys will be gone. And you know, I'm very sorry to bring this news. But there's been this big breakthrough. I think the way you want to think about the importance of this is what did accounting look like before and after double entry bookkeeping came in in the Renaissance? It's about 500 years ago. And double entry bookkeeping had a profound effect on forcing people to behave honestly because records had to reconcile with each other in a certain way that was internally consistent. This takes it to the next level, you know, maybe the next level squared. And it makes things line up in a way that is mathematically infallible, impossible to tamper with, and doesn't really require you to call in that trusted third party to sign off on things anymore. Now, accounting firms don't see it this way. You know, they're trying very hard to you know, create this as an opportunity for them and so forth. But I think um, you know, th this is really, really different than what we've had before. And I'll go forward and talk more about this, but it, it, it forces you to ask a lot of these questions about why do we need these gatekeepers and validators who've been part of the system really for hundreds or thousands of years. So again, the chaining of the blocks, the, the key insight here is simply that each block depends on the hash of the block before it. And if I change one aspect of one block, the whole future of the chain gets perturbed and thrown off. Now, who writes these blocks into the chain? This has turned out to be 
the real frontier of dispute between industry and entrepreneurs these days. If you go back to the model of Haber and Stornetta, they proposed some trusted third party would have the authority to write each block into the chain, but they would have to then make the ledger public so that they would crowdsource the inspection of it, that everybody could see the records. Who would the trusted third party be? If you're thinking about intellectual property, they said, well, maybe somebody like the Patent Office or UNESCO or somebody like that, who you know, we all agree is a benign, you know, whatever. <laughs> Nakamoto looked at this very differently. He said, there is no such thing as a trusted third party. We see third parties all over the world, and they behave badly. They act as gatekeepers who ration access. They charge fees like a monopolist would, since they control who can use it. Um, they sometimes change the ledger to favor their friends. Maybe not in this country, but certainly in other countries like Russia, you know, friends of Putin get extra bank deposits and so forth. Um, they become single points of failure, where if the bank goes down, you know, nobody can use their debit card for the afternoon and so forth. Um, they decide when the market will be open, and it's usually not open very much because they want to play golf and so forth. So if you kind of read down this list of problems and you think, this sounds a lot like the banking system we have, yeah, that's kind of the point. And rather than put this in the hands of these you know, ruthless people, Nakamoto decided to crowdsource this. He creates a solution where blocks are going to be coded through the cooperation of the community with an incentive system motivating them to take part in this. So the way it works on the Bitcoin network, and I would call this the open model or a public blockchain, is that anybody can write the next block, but you have to compete with other nodes on the network. So every 10 minutes with Bitcoin, there's actually a reward put out, which is 12 and a half Bitcoins. And at current market prices, that's somewhere north of $10,000. And if you can successfully code the next block before anybody else does, you get those Bitcoins. And so this is actually money creation or seniorage. It, it's awarded on a competitive basis. Um, what he's really created is something that he calls competitive accounting or competitive bookkeeping, that you set up a race between anybody who wants to be a bookkeeper and whoever can do it the quickest is going to win. Now, you would think that this would be easy, that anyone with a fast computer could bundle these transactions and hash them and take the hash of the last block and so forth. But he makes the problem difficult because you don't want hackers and spammers entering into this and subverting the system. So what you need to create a block is actually four elements. The transaction route, the Merkle route that we talked about before. You need the hash of the previous block. You need the timestamp. And you need this one other thing called the nonce. The nonce is a proof of work strategy that raises the cost for anybody who wants to enter this competition. What it is is a random number that can't be solved for or derived in any way. It can only be found by pure trial and error guesswork. And it's a random number that when combined with these other three pieces of data generates a hash function below a certain critical value. In other words, a hash function with a certain number of leading zeros. So if a hash function looks like this, imagine that I required you to guess a random number that when I put it together with all the other data, created a hash where the first 13 digits were all zero. And I wouldn't get this right away. In fact, I might have to guess about a billion random numbers before I actually found it. And what you need to play in this game is basically a very fast supercomputer. In the early days, you could do this at home with a laptop. And then as Bitcoin started to become valuable, you needed a special graphics card that would make the thing go faster. But today, people have dedicated hardware that's basically custom designed only for Bitcoin mining. And the real cost of this is actually the energy required to power these supercomputers. So there are big bunkers like this in places like Iceland where people do nothing but mine for Bitcoins all day. This is called mining because Nakamoto said this is analogous to mining for gold in the old days. 
that as a reward for keeping the books faster than anybody else, we're going to give you new Bitcoins, so you're going to compete for them, just like gold miners looking for the next big strike in California. And um, what's attractive about Iceland is that you get geothermal energy for free from the ground, so you don't have to pay the electric bill. Um, most of these people today are actually in Inner Mongolia, and the reason is completely bizarre, that the local government built a big hydroelectric dam and then the national government refused to take the electrical power because of some political rivalry. I mean, it's just total local politics settling scores. So they have all this electricity that they can't use, and, and they're willing to give it away for free to anybody who will move next to the dam. And so you now have a zillion Bitcoin mines taking this free power. And all the Bitcoin mines in the world are in either in Inner Mongolia or Iceland, you know, which are the two most unlikely places. This will continue until they start charging for electricity in China. And I imagine that this won't be forever. You know, anyway, there's a lot of color in this industry. But what you have are thousands of miners competing with each other and updating the books in, in a way that is extremely efficient. So what you've moved from is a model that looks like this. You've got, say, four retail banks, or call these stock brokerages, and there's something called the clearinghouse. Think of this as the DTCC in New York, which keeps the master ledger, and everybody goes against them, and this ledger is the authoritative one. In Nakamoto's system, we all trade with each other. We all have a copy of the same ledger, and we all share responsibility for updating it. Now, what's gone, of course, is the clearinghouse. You know, I've showed this to a friend of mine who's a big banker, like right near the top. I said, let me just be clear. He says, I get it, I get it. This is us over here, and, and we're, we're gone over here. And um, this, is, this is the problem that all the banks are facing, is that if you do this stuff on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, you really don't need somebody being the authority for which trades count, because this is being done endogenously on the network. Now, this is a particularly good picture for showing the logic of this. Let's say you want to steal somebody's assets that are already somewhere on the blockchain. So you want to go back, let's say, to block 74 and change a transaction. This is what fraud or theft would be. If you do this, Everybody else is already working on block 91 up here. And for this block to be built successfully, all of these other blocks in between in sequence have to have the right hash codes. So if you were to steal something here, you would have to redo all of these other blocks in the 10 minutes before these people do the next block. And in other words, what you'd basically need is a computer that is 17 times faster than anybody else's. And to the best of our knowledge, this doesn't exist. I, I get asked a lot about what about quantum computers and Putin's secret computers and so forth. Um, we need to worry about these things. There's definitely threats from you know, development of ultra-fast hardware and so forth, or if anybody figures out how to invert a hash code, um, this would be a big problem. But I think the bottom line is that these concerns are greatly less than the concerns in the financial system that we already have. That, you know, this is not without risk and without danger, but if you think about how often the system of SWIFT codes and the credit card ID numbers and so forth are being hacked, it's almost a daily thing to the point that we just take it for granted it will happen with a certain frequency. So I think important to be mindful of, of the technical issues here, but they are greatly less than the ones that we already have. Now, as I mentioned before, this is really the battle that's being fought out, is Will the world follow the model of Bitcoin with an open source blockchain system? And this is attractive because it's so democratic that anybody can join. No one rations access to it. Governance is purely democratic. And um, there's open competition. This, this network basically grows and shrinks according to user demand. The alternative is what's called a permissioned blockchain. And there are many industry consortiums, the most well-known of which is an organization called R3CEV. What they're doing is saying, this system is too dangerous. Your data is seen by too many people. Um, 
hackers and Chinese mining communities can get in and see your data, you know, whatever. And therefore, it's important to still restrict access and have a central gatekeeper. So R3 is a consortium of 70 major banks. And these are all the banks that you would have heard of, JP Morgan, UBS, um, Barclays, um, many Asian, Australian banks, and so forth. And they're working together on about 20 shared platforms that would use blockchains to trade everything from foreign exchange to credit default swaps to commercial syndicated loans and so forth. So I don't want to minimize the importance of this. I think what you're going to see, maybe as soon as this year, is a lot of the world's major banks transitioning the way they exchange assets to blockchain-based platforms. And R3 is not the only one of these consortiums. There's another group called Hyperledger that's working on this. Um, but essentially, the issue of who gets to be part of this is one that I see as a very interesting one for the competition authorities in particular. You know, if there's 70 banks in R3, what if I'm bank 71? You know, and what if I want to play and under what conditions? But on the other hand, these 70 banks are funding the development of this thing, and they don't want other people to come in and free ride on their R&D and so forth. So some interesting questions will have to be sorted out down the road. Um, but these are the legacy banks looking for ways to protect their franchise. You know, there's no long and short about it, that they don't want to disappear. They don't want to become, you know, this thing that is gone from the middle of the picture. And... I think what's happening at R3 now is among the most important things going on in the capital markets and will determine an awful lot about what the markets look like. So I've been to meet them and visit them. This is their office in New York. It's like a bunch of kids in hoodies. And I've been up to the NASDAQ where they have a vice president for blockchain. I'll talk more about them in a minute. But these are like very young people who might have gone to college, maybe not, but they all are showing up on skateboards with Starbucks and so forth. They work whatever hours they want, and they know how to code. And um, you know, people ask me for career advice all the time, and I say, well, you need to learn to program in Python and do a lot of this big data stuff. And um, it's, it's very unsettling to people. These are not people who wear three-piece suits and interview at the AFAs and so forth. So... What are the uses for this? You know, the digital currency case, I think it's very obvious, and Bitcoin now has an eight-year track record of data, but it's hardly the only thing that you can put onto a blockchain. And this is just one schematic. I have highlighted a couple things here that I think are of great interest to finance people, that for trading shares of stock, for trading bonds, um, contracts such as credit default swaps and so forth, they're all very obvious applications. And you can just scan this thing, things like tickets to movies or the keys to your car, um, patent records, um, charitable contributions, and so forth. There, you know, almost anything tracked on a database could probably be tracked cheaper and with greater accuracy on a blockchain than under the current systems that we have now. So this is a little bit of a preview. This is really what I want to talk about tomorrow. But I wrote an academic paper last December, just over a year ago, and I said before long there may be some company going public on a blockchain, and this actually happened before the month was out. So December 30th, 2015 was the first ever blockchain IPO, and it was on a platform that the NASDAQ in New York had developed. They now have a blockchain market called the NASDAQ Link. And their thunder was quickly overtaken by the Australians. The Australians made an announcement just under a year ago, in January of 2016, that they were going to retrofit the entire Sydney Stock Exchange, the ASX, with a back-end blockchain system for clearing and settlement. So this is not one company on some experimental thing. This is like a real stock market in a real country. They're going to you know, switch the whole thing. It's supposed to start next summer if it stays on schedule. Now, since this time, um, among many other markets, I've lost track, but I know that Zurich and New York are looking at this very closely. And I think, you know, before long, all the stock markets, the back end, are going to embrace this blockchain as a way of greatly reducing the, the, the cost and the time to settle trades. But what about this idea of listing your securities, you know, not just the... Um, clearing and settlement, but the actual marketing of the shares on a blockchain on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. 
Um, this is sort of what I was referring to earlier with Uber and Airbnb, that you could go public and you could do it if an organized exchange kind of welcomes you onto a blockchain platform, but you could also skip the exchange completely and just start your own blockchain. So Uber could start the Uber equity blockchain and say we have a million shares of stock for offer on a peer-to-peer -peer basis and they could update it with mining every 10 minutes just like Bitcoin and so forth. And how would this thing finance itself? You could either pay user fees for every share traded or you could have endogenous rewards to outsiders who competed for them. You know, in other words, you could decentralize the entire market for the company's shares. Now, would you want to do this? Um, one reason you might want to do it is that there's a 7% underwriting spread in the equity markets that you know, everybody doesn't feel so happy about paying. But there's all kinds of other asymmetric information, um, screening effects that not everyone who wishes to can easily sell shares into the market. Um, I think that the future of corporate finance looks very much like this. And the first ever blockchain issue in this format actually took place just over a month ago in November. There's a company called Overstock.com. They put out a preferred stock issue on their own blockchain. It was really to prove the concept because they want to sell this blockchain to other companies. Um, I've been down to the SEC and they got their hands on my paper. I was there for a totally different purpose and they called me into this conference room where the head of the Division of Corporate Finance was there with a bunch of lawyers. He said, this will never happen, and if it does, we're going to regulate it and watch it. I said, how can you regulate it? He says, well, existing law says. And I said, these people aren't even in the United States. In fact, they're not anywhere. They're in the cloud. You know, and that's how Nakamoto designed this. This completely bypasses all existing sovereign control and regulation because it's not in any identifiable location. And it raises huge problems that at the very least will force the U.S. to rewrite the securities laws to accommodate this. And I think every country in the world is going to have to take a bottom-up view of the laws of banking, securities markets, credit markets, and so forth to accommodate what's a real paradigm shift in technology. So they angrily kicked me out and then they called me back two days later. They said, do you want to come down and explain this again? And then they invite me back for a third time. You know, and, and at this point, um, regulators around the world really understand and are actively seeking advice from tech people and people in industry and so forth. But there's a real interesting change going on that's going to, you know, to change the way that customers and investors interact with each other. And the government's going to have to think very differently about how and even if they can oversee this. Let me point out a few more examples and then we'll stop and have a few minutes for questions. Um, one of the areas where blockchains are already being used very actively, and this is an enormous market, is basically in logistics and supply chain management. So this is an article about BHP Billiton, which is the largest mining company in the world. And they dig up iron ore and gold and other metals, and then many vendors and suppliers handle the inventory, refine it, give it back, ship it, whatever. And this is a massive inventory tracking problem. They've decided that they can do this much better on a blockchain than under the technology that they're already using. And I think this is a firm with revenues in the direction of $100 billion a year that is um, you know, introducing a very new technology for a very old problem. So this is... Um, one little corner of finance that we sometimes call working capital management, but I think blockchains have a huge footprint that they probably will leave across this one sector of the economy. Um, authenticating luxury goods. My wife likes to shop for Louis Vuitton purses and Chloe handbags, you know, and so forth. And there is a constant worry that these are counterfeit. There are other people who like to buy gemstones and want to be sure that these are not conflict diamonds that were mined by you know, Islamic State slave labor in some corner of Africa or something like that. Um, there are museums with priceless art collection where the provenance and you know, the ownership of the work is somewhat in doubt. All of these things 
can be authenticated through blockchain databases that either trace the chain of custody or prove that ownership transferred hands at a certain time or that in a limited edition of prints that there really are only 100 prints and they can all be found on this blockchain. So authenticating fine art seems to be a very nice opportunity for blockchain. I spoke at a conference last summer in The Hague in the Netherlands with people there from Interpol and the art museums and so forth who are looking actively at a worldwide art registry that they're going to put on a blockchain that would ultimately be used to deal with things like the restitution of art stolen by the Nazis in World War II and those kinds of problems. Um, government records, this is the first ever blockchain birth certificate where somebody in Argentina, who's a real believer in the technology, didn't get a regular birth certificate for his child. Instead, he made a 20-second video clip on the day the baby was born and then hashed it into the Bitcoin blockchain as proof that the baby existed on that day and included all the vital statistics, gender, height, weight, and so forth, you know, all the information you would have on a birth certificate. And this may be the future of vital statistics in government that not just birth certificates, but immigration records. The Australians are very aggressively going for a blockchain national ID program. They say this will be used for everyone from the border police to the tavern keepers who want to check your age. And you won't even have to tell them your age. The blockchain will just return over or under age 17 and so forth. So I think you know, the, the limits to what you can do with this, especially in the public sector, are almost beyond imagination. But huge amount of entrepreneurial activity is going into imagining new use cases and thinking about how to develop them and get governments interested in using them. So let me, let me draw a line here. It's about five minutes to, and I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. And we'll tomorrow have a further lecture and pick up on the back end of this. So. Um, you know, please, anybody who wishes, yes. Can models such as Simon Dibbinger make serve a role by turning liquid, uh, deposits that investors need at, at liquid terms into loans that firms need so that can't be paid back immediately? Right. Even with the blockchain technology, wouldn't there be a need for some sort of banking institution to turn liquid assets into the liquid ones? Yeah, in fact, Wednesday, we're going to talk about this. I, the whole lecture on Wednesday is about how the banking system might look in the future. Um, the very short answer is that deposit taking and credit provision are two very different functions. And they've been put together almost by necessity in the modern banking system. But down the road, they may well be separated from each other. And companies that make loans may have to finance themselves very differently than demand deposits. Your bank account won't be at Chase Manhattan. It will probably be at the Federal Reserve. But we'll get to this later in the week. Yes? Yeah, there is a lot of demand for data storage. And the way these ledgers are currently stored is that anybody who wishes to have a copy just downloads it and keeps it on their hard drive. Um, the Bitcoin blockchain, I think today, is about 30 gigs. So even with an eight-year history with many, many transactions, it's not an overwhelming demand for storage. Um, I do think it, um, it requires you to have a lot of computer hardware with a lot of security that it's not vulnerable to like a nuclear pulse or something like that. But the strategy is really to decentralize this, to spread it all over the world, um, massive redundancy and so forth. And up to now, the cost of data storage seems far down the list compared to things like the cost of the energy required to power the network and so forth. So I'm not sure that's immediately seen as a problem by people. Um, yes? I'm curious, this Bitcoin system not having a finite path yet? Say we're older than Bitcoin down the road. Yeah. And you mentioned quantum computing and stuff like that. So it decentralizes power up to a couple. But government is typically the institution which has the highest, they have the highest So I think the question is, wouldn't governments have enough technology to undermine this system down the road? Um, I don't know. Um, I've been reading a lot in the newspapers in the last week or two about you know, the lack of technology in the US government to 
you know, I, I mean, you can make up your own mind about this, but I've never been particularly impressed by the government's ability to develop new technology. Now, having said that, they did come up with the hash codes and so forth, but nevertheless, you can't keep, you know, Putin from hacking the Democrats and so forth. Um, you do worry, though, that, you know, some rogue government that gets an Uber technology, you know, what if the North Koreans develop a faster computer? Um, yeah, I mean, this is something to be concerned about, but we already have these concerns, right? And I don't think that's a reason to um, not look at this te technology. And in fact, you can't put this back in the bottle even if you wish to, right? Um, yes? So how would you, or what solutions are there no, this is a very interesting problem because a lot of the attraction of this stuff is it allows you to bypass the anti-money laundering stuff. Now, this is a problem for the government, and you can't stop this technology. And, you know, it's, it's easy enough for us to sit in a lecture room and say, this makes it easier to launder money. Um, I think putting the central bank in charge of a national blockchain, again, what I'll talk about Wednesday, would go a long way toward doing this. But in the end, if there were private currencies that were widely used, um, they are pretty good devices for money laundering. And it's not obvious that the government's going to be able to keep up with people's tactics. Having said that, when I first really understood the potential of this was when the US Senate held hearings on Bitcoin. This goes back to the fall of 2013. And Bernanke showed up and he said, this is interesting technology, and it has a role to play. And I thought, why would the head of the Federal Reserve want this? And I realized that one of the things you get with the blockchain is an archive of every transaction ever. And that even if you can't tell today who's laundering the money, you, can, you have all the time you need to figure it out. You know, it's not like Milton Friedman talked about with passing the dollar and then no one knows whose hands it came through. Um, you leave footprints on the blockchain. And in the end, I think that somebody who wants to evade taxes or buy drugs or do something does it at their own risk. And, you know, the government may well be able to catch you down the road. And even if they don't have the greatest dragnet, the, um, the fear of, of being caught, you know, the potential penalties and so forth may be sufficient. But we'll see. I mean, this is going to be an interesting problem, I think, over the next 10 or 20 years. Yes? Yeah. I read that report, but it does not give the details how they calculate it. So could you say something more detailed about why this kind of distribute is saying that one, co one data should be have this type of copy and have an even reduced cost than essential data? You're asking for backup for the $20 billion claim? Is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, they haven't given the calculations to me either. And you're free. It's like the big number I just said. Yeah. You're free to disbelieve it. Um, <laughs> now. One thing, I don't know if I have it, it's in the next lecture, I'm afraid, but the clearing and settlement process takes three days and involves seven steps, all kinds of people taking a cut. This is for trades on the stock exchange. On a Bitcoin exchange, it takes zero people. It happens in a second. Um, you can just look at the employment in the securities industry and say, what if we just automated this with cryptography? and then back out the numbers that way. And, you know, the numbers that they are coming up with kind of square with the numbers you would get on a top-down basis from doing it that way. But, but you're going to need to contact them if you really want the details of their calculations. Yes? Yeah. Well, first of all, if someone had a faster computer, it would have to be faster than even the second fastest computer, right? You know, by, by some orders of magnitude to be able to go back and redo the blockchains. And there's an assumption that nobody's going to get that far ahead in secret. And probably if they did, there might be, you know, even better uses for the computer. Of inverting the hash code, I think that's a much more 
likely possibility, and there's already been several generations of hash codes that have been increasingly elaborate you know, to deal with exactly this problem. I think there's going to be a need for cryptography to, to ever faster you know, stay a step ahead of the, of the criminals and the rogues. And if somebody does figure out how to crack this stuff, they're going to have to make a calculation of whether to keep it secret or whether to go out and exploit it. Um, you know, apparently we've figured out how to hack all the Russian computers, but we never actually use it because it would give away our methods and we're saving it for something better. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, how would you know? Enough people would complain that, you know, you wouldn't be the only person. If everybody in the world suddenly had all their bitcoins transferred to the wallet of Putin, um, you know, there would be enough complaining that you might think of some type of intervention or restart or something of the system that would negate that. But, but how that would work out, we don't yet know. Um, yes? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is a huge issue. And much of what I want to talk about tomorrow, I'm going to talk about privacy, at least in the context of corporate finance, where shareholders like to keep their identity private and so forth. But one thing that this whole scheme does is lay bare all your transactions for everybody to see. Now, you're hiding behind a barrier of a digital wallet identifier. You know, they, they don't see that it's Dave, they see it's. 8342, you know, whatever, some funny code. But to match digital wallets with people, I think, is not so hard. You know, you just need a little bit of a spending pattern or whatever. And I think that people interested in privacy are either going to have to learn to live without it um, or continue banking the old way at a much higher cost. So you would essentially pay for your privacy. Or there's probably going to be an emerging industry of privacy providers. And there are some rudimentary products like Bitcoin tumblers, where you take 100 people's Bitcoins, shake them all up, and then spread it so that you can't really tell where they came from. But um, it's a very interesting problem. And you can point to other societies, especially in Scandinavia, where people have gotten over this a long time ago. You know, there's no privacy in Sweden, where you can look up your neighbor's tax returns and all their hospitalization records and so forth. And, um, I think it's going to be a cultural change, but it's one that young people seem more comfortable with, you know, that they don't immediately have these fears of privacy that the parents are trained to. Yes? What is open governance? What does that mean? What does that look like? What is it? It's a very interesting topic. Open governance in a system like this means the right to rewrite the code. And so if somebody wants to change the code of Bitcoin, so Let's say you wanted to change the cycle time from 10 minutes to 5 minutes, and there was some reason for this. You could actually go home tonight, any of you, write a new version of the code and put it out there. And if 51% of the people start running your software, that becomes the new code. So what open governance means is it's a little bit like the Swiss right of initiative from the population, is that anybody can propose anything, and you just have to get majority support. Now, a lot of people see this as very virtuous because there's no dictator, no agenda setter, but there are some obvious problems as well. And one problem is that maybe nothing ever gets fixed because no one can ever get 51% to agree, and this seems to be a problem with Bitcoin. It's also susceptible to charlatans and rabble-rousers and you know, populists who can somehow rally you know, 51% you know, or you know, 304 electoral votes or whatever to support incredibly stupid things because they're charming. And um, God knows that the world has seen a long history of this as well. And I think the governance of blockchains is a particularly fascinating problem. Um, my, my own area is corporate governance where I do like my real research or my legacy research. And um, I think who's, who's in charge of the blockchain and you know, what it means to have open governance and permission gatekeeper governance is going to become a huge research topic, both in industry and government, but also in academia. But it's supposed to be a very organic, bottom-up form of democracy. Yes? It's, it's interesting. It, it really doesn't cut quite that simply between developed and developing. The, um, the biggest market for 
bitcoins and electronic commerce is China by far. And then the U.S. is number two. But these are two very different countries in terms of development. Um, you definitely have places like Singapore, Sweden, Germany, where there are big pockets of users. Um, and then entire continents like Africa and South America, where there's a minimal presence. So I think the potential to reach the unbanked and to enter into areas like international remittances for the poor and so forth is really very attractive. And you go to these technologies and the UN refugee people will be there and so forth. Um, but to date, um, with the exception of China, I would say it's mostly concentrated in some of the more elite, higher educated, Western oriented nations. But I wouldn't expect that to be a permanent state of affairs based on how many more people have mobile phones than bank accounts in these countries. But we'll see. I think this is a very interesting question that um, admits a lot of further study. Now, I think you know, maybe one more question, then I think there's going to be classes that you guys have at 120 and so forth. Yes? It's on the blockchain, though. Oh, 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 the video that you would, um, yeah, he'd better keep some copies and you know, email them to people and so forth. Um, you, have, you have exactly the same problem you know, with the Bureau of Vital Statistics, right? You know, I, could, I could walk into, I live in Morristown, New Jersey. I say, I want my son's birth certificate. And they say, well, prove that he's your son. And I'm going to need to you know, produce the boy or a driver's license or whatever. Um, but yeah, how you authenticate it, I'm not sure this guy with the video clip has it exactly right. You know, fair enough. Okay, so thank you guys all for coming and listening, and we'll do this again tomorrow, same time. Thank you.